Um, welcome everybody to this session. Um, so my name is Fiona. I'm a, a researcher at UBC in the Department of Psychiatry. And it's really my pleasure to be the moderator for this panel session. Um, I think we enjoyed a, a really brilliant and inspiring um, talk by uh, Dr. Trevor Robbins in just the previous session. So thank you for quickly grabbing a cup of tea and joining us again. And I think this is a really nice segue into just the next 50 minutes to an hour where we can have a, a discussion on um, some of those key elements that you have covered in, in the previous uh, session. And then also to hear from uh, two other brilliant scientists, researchers, uh, Dr. Phillips, Dr. Guy, who has spent and really dedicated um, their long career to understanding a lot of these mechanisms to making these applications and to really you know, trying to develop models to understand um, the psychiatric conditions and develop translational models at this point in, in your careers and been working on it for, for many years now. And so really delighted to hear from you. Um, I did prepare a, a very basic um, model slide here that, see if that works here. Um, and I think for those in our session, um, just to, to make this session is being recorded so that we could archive you know, all the talks. As Tonya mentioned earlier, there are like simultaneous sessions going on. So people will unfortunately have to pick. So we will have all these posted so people can, can rewatch and revisit this information that's being shared. Um, and another piece is, this is a workshop style. So we'd like to make it as interactive as possible um, and rather than you know, lecture-based. So we welcome all comments and questions to be posted either on the Whova app or here on the Zoom chat. So I'll try my best to keep track of the questions that are being posted and then try to um, introduce them to the panelists. All right, so without further ado, I first do want to introduce our, our three panelists here. Um, so we've we've heard from uh, Dr. Robbins just previously, and he's a professor of cognitive neuroscience um, at the University of Cambridge. And um, I know the previous introduction already listed out all of your accomplishments and awards you received. Um, I also wanted to just add another note that um, he's really pioneered accomplishments in developing methodologies for um, developing methodologies for parallel behavioral assessments in humans, rodents, and monkeys as well. And to combine um, these models and looking at psychopharmacological processes and how to apply that to translational and clinical research. So I think we'll hear from, more about that later. Um, I'd also like to introduce Dr. Mark Geyer, who's a distinguished professor of psychiatry and neurosciences emeritus at the University of California, San Diego. And he directs the neuropsychopharmacological pharmacology unit of the Veterans Association and Veterans Administration Mental Illness Research uh, Clinical and Education Center. Now his academic career is really focused on basic research that's addressing psychotic disorders and the related behavioral and neurobiological effects of psychedelics and other psychoactive drugs. So that's very exciting and we really look forward to hearing about that. And he has also recently co-founded the Psychedelics and Health Research Initiative at UCSD that's exploring the efficacy of psychedelics in the treatment of pain disorders. And then our third panelist here who probably needs not much additional introduction would be Dr. Tony Phillips. And he's a professor of psychiatry at UBC and also head of translational medicine for substance use disorders lab and also the cluster lead for this matrix and uh, research cluster. And um, he has done outstanding work and has a long-standing interest in applying knowledge that's concerning normal uh, brain behavior function in order to understand the neural basis of mental illness. And he's pioneered research that focuses on the role of dopamine in motivation, memory, and substance misuse. And most recently on novel options for opioid withdrawal management and the treatment of substance use disorders. So we look forward to hearing about that as well in this panel. Um, so the very brief model slide um, here. So this is an, I think a way that we can uh, look at forward and reverse translation. And I think um, Dr. Robbins had really mentioned some of the key elements here that are very essential to bridging the gaps um, and moving from basic research through 
translational research as a very critical piece that's to connect it to, to clinical uh, research and really clinical application. Um, and so there has been a lot of, I think, forward translation, but maybe the reverse translation is a piece we really wanna focus on today and how to really move effectively backwards, especially in those arrows that are um, connecting clinical research back to translational um, and what are the targets and um, symptomologies that really can be modeled effectively and maybe some that um, are not that needs to be recognized and maybe revisited, um, so to speak, and in terms of in order to moving back into basic research and developing really functional studies that can in turn then model the human condition. Um, now, Let's move, I'll move back to the, to the screen so we can see hopefully most of the individuals who are on the panel. Um, so Dr. Robbins, we've uh, heard from your, your comments about the models and some of the, um, I guess, difficulties in developing this model and, and in reverse translation. Do you want to give just a very brief, um, I guess, summary of what you think are some successful examples of this research strategy in your career? Uh, we'll start with you and then we can move on to Dr. Geyer and then Dr. Phillips. Robert, you're, oh, I think you're muted. Uh, We've never we've never developed a, an effective drug for psychiatric disorder, despite all this work. Mm -hmm. We've mainly been involved in developing methods and and you know showing the ways of doing something. But I think the real problem has been so. Take for example, you know, working on this is something which Mark knows at least as much about as I do: uh, cognitive deficits in schizophrenia. Okay. So what can you do? Well, you can measure what the nature of these cognitive deficits are in schizophrenia, and then you can try and simulate these in so-called animal models, animal preparations, okay? And you can do that very nicely. The pre-pulse inhibition is something which marks work with a lot, and it's a very, very nice you know, method outcome variable, which you can easily measure in rodents as well and other species. So it's tremendous translational potential. You can also measure spatial work in memory uh, effectively. In a, and this is something Tony has done with Dan Fresco, and we've done it in humans as well as animals. You know, And we know that these systems involve dopamine and the frontal cortex and so forth and so on. So this is all very good. But at the end of the day, you have to come up with a drug. And, you know, we haven't been armed with the best possible agents, you know, the D1 agonists have problems at a, a kind of you know, symptomatic level. Um, sometimes you see, I mean, working as I've done with drug companies, and I know Tony and Mark have done the same, where occasionally you, you, you get access to you know, a hot compound, an interesting compound, um, but not always. Actually. <laughs> you know, we applied to work with the Pfizer compound, the Pfizer D1 agonist, and they, they were very, very reluctant to let us try it out on spatial working memory in Parkinson patients for reasons best known to themselves. <laughs> in case it didn't work, maybe. Um, you know, so that's that's the real problem that I've had. I mean, you know, we've shown that modafinil kind of does something in schizophrenia, it does something in animals. We've shown that atomoxetine can be used across a range of um, psychiatric. Uh, symptoms involved in inhibition in different disorders. Um, we've looked at this opioid mu, and mu receptor antagonist 498 and shown it's very, very promising in the treatment of substance use disorders and binge eating, actually. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's up to the drug company whether they take it forward or not. And I think generally they don't. I don't know, what's your response, Mark? Well, of course, one of the problems is as soon as they get past phase two and the phase three studies, they, I think the part of the pharma industry that deals with the studies and designs what readouts they're going to tolerate get very separated from the biological 
input that is retained at least through phase two. And my experience with M100907 and the serotonin um, 2A antagonist was even though there was a multi-site trial and we had the preclinical and, and some of the phase two stuff involved prepulse inhibition, <clears throat> And <clears throat> there were nine sites, <clears throat> nine sites that had the equipment to do prepulse inhibition assessments uh, just to see whether that would be predictive of which of the patients might be responsive versus which were not, because that was our prediction from the animal work. Um, they wouldn't let me. Um, okay. You know, we offered it at no cost. Um, <laughs> There was one site, it was a seven arm trial, about 15 patients per site, and we had one site doing it, and they said, well, we've already got one. But I think you hit the nail on the head when you said they get very nervous about having to report to FDA in the US, the EMA there, any unexpected results from phase three. So once it gets to phase three, a systemic problem is the nature of the um, anxiety associated with the enormous fiscal risk that they're undertaking in phase three. And career so, risks as well. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. unfortunately, we get very little um, reverse translatable information uh, from Absolutely. phase three data because it's almost all verbal. Absolutely. There are, Absolutely. Our rodents may talk, but they don't talk to us. But then, but then the alibi might be that the animal model didn't work. That seems to be the culprit. And <laughs> several of us have stra stressed that it takes two to tango, that it... Yeah have a relationship, a predictive relationship, you have to have both sides of the equation. And we, mm -hmm. so I know Trevor and I have both worked hard to try to encourage, at least in phase two, um, reverse translatable, which means nonverbal um, assessments so that we could, you know, validate or invalidate and we need to do both, depending upon the nature of the drug mm. and the nature of the population. Um, and it, that's been a struggle. And, and I think Trevor, more than anybody else, has, has established um, workable human assessment tools um, to quantify behavior in a way that we can connect to the, the animal preclinical assessments and so i i'm frustrated that the the tools are there yeah but it hasn't worked out for us you know the answer might be might have to be that universities or institutes have to take on drug development but how can that happen because it's so expensive right you know yeah. i mean there are some examples aren't there a, a con is it uh, Phil Conn at uh, Vanderbilt? Yes. Um, you know, he he yeah, manufactures definitely. his own glutamate receptor agents, doesn't he? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I don't know how on earth he manages to do that with his, perhaps he gets a huge grant from somewhere, I don't know, but it, it just requires a lot of money, obviously, to develop a drug. Right. And the other problem I, that I've come up against, uh, Mark and Tony, I don't know whether you, you've experienced this, you know, the new... The new kind of system is biotechs, right? So the big pharma will license a drug to another to a smaller company for them to develop it. And this will come with a, a slug of financing. But very often that financing doesn't go very far. You know, it, it may be can actually I'm involved in a study at the moment. Um, looking at uh, a drug which might be good for treating OCD, actually. Um, and we can do a couple of experiments on rodents on that, which kind of boost the evidence a bit higher. And then basically what the biotech wants to do is to you know, write a patent application or sell it back to Big Pharma. They're not in a position where they can do patient studies. 
<laughs> so I don't think that model works either very well. Mm -hmm. Would you say that a large obstacle then is really the structure isn't there to bridge yeah. these gaps? And I, um, and I financially and then yeah. at the system level. And I have to say, I have to say, um, you know, I think Tom Insel did a you know good job at NIMH, and I think um, Nora and George Coop are doing great jobs in NIDA and NIAAA as well. Um, however, they do have huge resources um, for medications development, and I think that's been, you know, the major the major pot of money that might have been used to achieve this, either themselves or perhaps in partnership with Big Pharma somehow. I don't know very much about that. Probably Mark or Tony will know more, being involved in similar agencies in Canada, Tony. Um, yeah. But do you agree? You know, I mean, that seemed to me to be a, a very good opportunity for academic uh, industrial liaison. In Europe, we had this thing called the Innovative Medicines Initiative, and it was pretty good. Um, so there were a number of basic labs associated with the number of companies that subscribed to this. Um, and it, it did. Uh, Mark, I think, was on the advisory board. You know, there was <coughs> there were some good achievements there, but um, it needed sustained funding for that to work. You know, you need ten or fifteen years of funding, not five years. Five years, you just get used to the other people. And you do a few collaborative studies and get to trust one another. But you need 15 years to do this. Yeah, one of the exciting aspects of that uh, new meds uh, <coughs> new 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 initiative yeah. was that it was designed um, to get multiple large pharma companies talking to one another. And as you said, trusting those communications. Um, it was a great design, but as you say, it, it needed more continuity of support. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, it's the type of thing, it's a bit like Imogen and the ABCD project. Yeah. You know, the Imogen was the European version that just looked at 14 year olds for a couple of years with a few, quite a few tests. And ABCD is kind of amazing. It's um, you know, 12,000 10 year olds for a decade looking at genetics, neuropsychology, imaging, the whole lot to predict mental illness vulnerability. But it's going to cost what half a billion dollars? Yeah, or more. Yeah. That's what you need. You need, you need a billion dollars to do this. Right. But we have um, an audience. That, oh, sorry, Tony, I'm interrupting you. We had someone in the audience no. with a hand up too, um, uh, with a question as well. So, Doris, would you? Like to to ask the panelists a question. Yes, I I am sorry, my video for some reason doesn't work on that computer. Um, I agree with a lot of what you have all said. I see having worked both with animal and human, and I'm still sitting on the ethics committee for clinical research committee for UBC. I see actually the issue not just being with developing a drug being the problem with the drug company, but a lot of it has to do with the animal model. It is true that it is very cheap to do rodent study, but rodents are not human. A normal rodent, the ones that live in a lab, have nothing to do in behavior like a wild rodent. I mean, and there has been studies that have been done showing that a normal rodent that you see in the street does not behave at all like the rodents that you see in, in a lab. So already we have a problem by looking at an animal which is not normal to begin with, and is, uh, um, which is very different from, uh, from primates. So it is true that we would need lots of money to be able to do primate study. But as you all know, primate studies are absolutely impossible to do now because the government and the institution do not provide any support for people doing animal study. I mean, there are universities like Wisconsin, for example, which are very, who have a long history of doing primate study, um, who have been very 
uh, there have been many people in Wisconsin who have actually developed extremely beautiful model for, uh, um, or even an NIMH, for uh, uh, psychiatric and psychological disturbance in primate. But they are not supported in most places. I was not supported at UBC. Most other people in Europe or in the US or Canada are not supported to do primate study. So we would need actually to do primate study to have a support for more than five years. 15, as you said, Trevor, would be probably much better. Um, to try to develop models that have actually a relevant to psychiatric disorder. Then, um, then when you go to go into the clinic, as you say, it is so expensive to actually create that. But it's also the paperwork that you have to do. Mm -hmm. um, supposedly, and I say that in quote, to protect individual and participant, um, the ethics committee quite often create barriers, which are actually only, I am sorry, I have always been said that, are as covering exercise for the university of the hospital. Many participants would be willing to share their data, be involved in a lot more study, but this is not allowed because one person of 10,000 could actually complain. So I think we need uh, plus, of course, the optic of drug company in the public are actually big pharma is just there to make money and doesn't have any um, interest in us. I, I am not for big pharma necessarily, but I think if we want to actually uh, develop new drugs and they have the money to do it and they have the, the energy and the way to do it, we have to help them and we have to help translational scientists to actually create animal models who are actually relevant to primate or upper primate like we are, and we don't have the support. And that's, I think, one of the main issues. Can I comment on that? Um, so, well, yes, I, you know, I agree. It is, it is important to work with primates, but there are, there are a lot of limitations, actually. Um, I mean, rhesus monkeys are excellent, for example, for basic neuroscience, for electrophysiological recording and doing exquisite experiments in a very small number of animals. Um, actually, at Cambridge, we've, we're giving up rhesus monkeys um, when Wolfram Schultz finally um, retires, whenever that might be, um, in favour of the marmoset, because marmosets are much less expensive. Um, they do have a primate brain, and Angela Roberts is doing a wonderful job with primates and trying to you know, apply this to mental health disorders. Um, you know, these are animals where you could actually try a drug, for example, uh, in a reasonable end. But there are still enormous problems, I have to say. You know, it takes a long, long time to do a marmoset experiment, I can tell you. So our recent neuron paper took about four years, you know, and that's just a behavioural, well, and you know, a, a basic study looking at how the particular system in the brain works to control behavior. Um, takes a long, long time. And there are some things you can't do to primates for ethical reasons. Can't really give them mild electric shocks even, for example. So there are enormous problems. Um, and I think you have to use rodents, I'm afraid, is, is the most obvious. And, you know, I understand that we can get inspiration from ethological examples of wild animals and so forth. I, I do see that. But frankly speaking, um, you've, you've ultimately got to have consistency in data in a lab environment. So you have to use these so-called abnormal lab animals in order to do many of your studies, um, it seems to me. And, and of course, you have to realise as well that we're dealing with humans who aren't if you like, absolutely normal because they have mental health disorders. And so maybe the lab animal is appropriate. Tony, we haven't had a chance to hear from you. Okay, well, I want, there's several things I've, I'd like to um, mention, but staying with the mm -hmm. present topic, the, the beauty of your work, Trevor, is that you've shown consistency across the rodent, the primate and the human. Uh, and that's what is so remarkable about all the work that you and your colleagues have done. Given that there is relevance from the rodent to the, even to the marmoset primate, uh, 
shouldn't we try to do everything we can and refine the models at the rodent level because there is less ethical concern, maybe it's misplaced mm -hmm. uh, than there is for working with primates. And then in rare instances, we translate those findings into a primate model to, to do a proof of principle that would yeah. then link to the basic work that you quite properly suggest primate brains can be used for. And so we acknowledge the, the fact that these are advanced species with, you know, we talked about emotions earlier today, mm -hmm. uh, so, social interactions. I mean, you have to be very careful when you're using these animals. They're not just a throwaway object. Exactly. Uh, and uh, whereas rodents, for whatever historical reason, it's more acceptable um, to do the research. And also, I take great comfort from your work that it's relevant, you know, mm. providing that you dis you design the proper sorts of experiments. Mm. And I, so that would be my compromise in this discussion. No, I, I agree. I agree entirely with you. Tony, I mean, that, that that would be my preferred modus operandi, frankly, yeah. you know, to develop things in, in rodents and, and maybe translate some of them to primates, not human primates, and then obviously to patients. Yeah. Um, I also yeah, but, agree, but, especially but, if you want to actually use imaging study, mm. you need to do it in primate because in all honesty, you cannot do pet imaging and looking at neurotransmitter mm. and thinking that you are actually mimicking anything which has to do with human. Um, yeah. As Tony very well know it, I have kept my, my animals, my, my, my rhesus monkey, I kept them for 15, 20 years, most of them. Um, so you, you have to have the ability and the focus, even if you want to do that. I was working with rhesus, not with, um, not with a little one. Um, but you need to have the infrastructure, which is an infrastructure both in Mali, in facilities, as well as in human experience. And we are not favorizing the uh, human mm. um, infrastructure with the experience of dealing even with marmoset, which is, which is an interesting species to deal with, and mm. other primates. And so we need to think about that now if we want to develop in rodent and then go to a few animal in a higher species closer to, to human, we need mm. to have the ability to do that. And right now, I don't think we have it. Can I just make one point about that? I mean, one difficulty, I mentioned in my talk, the importance of getting the perturbation right for the model. You know, the perturb what do you do to make it a model? You know, um, we talked a bit about stress, for example, as one example, maybe genetic manipulation or whatever. It's quite hard to use perturbations in monkeys, actually. I mean, there aren't that many examples, are there, of, yeah, of monkey models that, that can easily be used. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of study looking at, well, let's say, in Wisconsin, where you take the animal as infant yeah. and raise them like, so, so like give human. Me an example, give me an example, for example, let's take cognitive deficits in schizophrenia. Obviously, you use the monkey to look at the working memory system and mm -hmm. lateral prefrontal cortex. But then how do you make it go wrong so that you can model that disorder and show that a drug will remediate that disorder in the disease model? That's where we would need the time and the ability to do it over long term study. May not be the 50 year or 100 year you will need in human, but you will need 15 to mm -hmm. 20 years. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. you, you can do genetic engineering in monkeys the same way that you can do it in, in rodent, except that it is a lot more complicated. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think, Doris, uh, if I may, Fiona, sorry, just to, um, I think what's coming out of this is the fact that we can't expect to be doing these sorts of very sophisticated primate models at every leading health university. And the Wisconsin model that you keep referring to uh, is one of those, and there's a, obviously a primate center in Oregon as well and other places, especially the one in Atlanta, Emory. Um, we need to perhaps designate these well-supported, um, really sophisticated sites for doing this type of work rather than trying to be uh, distributing it more widely. Um, that's an unfortunate fact of the expense, all the issues we've been talking about, 
Um, and again, that that's going to require somebody making political decisions and providing the resources to do this. Because the bottom line is that the information that you get from primate research is invaluable in drawing. And maybe this is one of the reasons why we have not advanced as quickly and as effectively as we'd hoped, because we haven't been able, as Trevor's saying, to bring the final model to the primate brain. Now, saying that, we do have lots of opportunities to do the work directly on humans who are affected. Um, and, you know, so that's another topic for discussion. But I want to bring the conversation about translational research uh, back to a different level. And Trevor, it goes to the example that we're all so familiar with right now, which is the ketamine example. Um, and I, I like this for several reasons, but the most um, inspiring reason is that this was a clinical observation. Um, you know, you gave a brief uh, description of the history here, but the point is that it was clinicians looking at the unexpected effects of what is really, uh, the doses used then, a horse tranquilizer. Um, you know, the people had were, were misusing uh, in raves and, uh, you know, for the misuse of drugs. But nevertheless, rather than just writing this off as some sort of a, uh, an interesting artifact, uh, Crystal and his colleagues and other people at Yale and elsewhere saw the relevance of this to, um, as a potential treatment for depression. But it's only because they they encouraged, this is where the back translation comes in. So you had an inspired clinician who also happened to be an excellent scientist. Yeah, serendipity, um, serendipity. Serendipity, but you know, serendipity favors the prepared mind. Yeah, yeah, the instructors, yeah, exactly. That's yeah. the other yeah. half of this equation. Yeah. And so part of the reason why we're emphasizing this backwards or reverse translation model is because we have to find a way to bring those really outstanding clinicians into this discussion. Yeah. Um, and in this sense, and take, they can take a leadership role and encourage us to do the work that we can do more deeply and more precisely at the, at the foundational level. And then it gets fed forward as it is, is happening in the ketamine story, trying to understand the mechanism of action, which we don't have yet, yeah. but we do have better models now and we can start to look for new variants of a ketamine-like molecule and then feed that back to the clinic. Yeah. But this sort of, um, the inspiration for this came from the clinic and from a clinician. So that's the part of translational research that really catches my eye. Yeah. yeah. The other element of it, if I may, is what we've been talking about thus far is equally important. It's the back translation, like having the clinicians involved in um, discussing the appropriate doses or the, the, when, you, when you've got your ketamine identified and you start to do the preclinical studies, they have to be, continue to be done in collaboration with clinicians. And the clinicians are feeding back their unique perspective on, a, on an innovation that's already been established. So the, how do you get the innovation in the first place from a clinical perspective? And how do you encourage basic scientists to really start to explain why the serendipitous event is so important. And that was all done in the case of ketamine. And then, as I've just said, the feeding forward of the more systematic program of research. So there's a two elements of this back translation that really catch my eye. Um, and so that's why we put it front and center in our Matrix M uh, initiative. Yeah, I think it's a really great example, Tony. I mean. The other one that I mentioned, I think, in the same category is probably Ritalin. Yes, yeah. Because we, don't, we, we really don't know for sure. I mean, we know a lot about Ritalin, obviously, but we really don't know quite what it is about Ritalin that's improving ADHD. I mean, mm. it's a completely paradoxical effect. It was tried, Bradley was the first person to try it, a clinician in 1937. Right. And I don't know how he got the idea, frankly, that a stimulant drug might be good for kids who are hyperactive. I mean, right. to make much sense. <laughs> but yeah. So how did he get that? You know, it's yeah. it's very interesting. But once he had it, 
uh, clearly it took a while, but somebody picked up on that, probably you and other people at Cambridge. Um, <laughs> You know, when you were looking at the effects of but anyway, it. But the, but, the idea, but the idea of trying to establish the mechanism and then obviously the psychedelics, that's true as well, isn't it, Mark? Absolutely. That, you know, it's not, it may not be the 5-HT2A receptor ultimately, might it? I, I don't know. You know, there's some suggestion that psilocybin works really centrally at all the receptors because of the metabolite. So, mm -hmm. so you know, you get dissociations there as well, potentially. Yeah. Well, we Between have a session on Hallucination that. and... I don't know. Yeah. So you've had a well, session. Mark has his whole, whole session. Uh, yeah. Is it this afternoon, Mark? At, uh, uh, no, there's one not going on now, actually. Uh, yeah. The effect of psychedelics and uh, substance use disorders. Um, so th this is a, like quite picking striking. Up on, yeah. Picking up on my uh, taking inspiration from, you know, uh, creative and I think um, bold clinicians. Let, let's now talk about that in the context of the psychedelic uh, revolution. Um, and really here, I think the, the onus is overcoming bureaucracy. We've talked about bureaucracy before. I mean, there has been, you know, a absolute um, ban on the use of psychedelics now for 50 years with probably, you know, given the excesses that happened in the 60s, with good reason. Um, but now some brave people have revisited it, you know, and then they've, in so doing, they have created a, an evidence base, which is starting to suggest that there may be benefits from the use of psychedelics in especially the treatment of depression. And, and then, you know, ketamine in a way is also uh, not classical, uh, psychedelic, but it has related properties. So, and now you've got you know members of Congress that are that are putting forward bills <clears throat> that are mandating the the uh, free use of psychedelics, uh, you know, either in their state or nationally. Um, so, that, so what I'm coming to is the fact that this has created then this. Uh, wave of backward translation, you know, it's coming out again of uh, object, uh, almost subject and objective observations of the effects of these drugs. And then the generalization from, from the, again, the prepared mind of, you know, well, well educated uh, clinicians. So, anyway, so Mark, what, what's been your uh, experience of late in this adventure? Well, boy, it's an adventure. Um, <laughs> as one who's studied psychedelics, although we couldn't call them psychedelics in the early years, yeah. uh, for, well, 40 years, my first grant from NIDA on what we called either psychotomimetics or hallucinogens was in 1981. Wow. Um, so I was one of about five laboratories in the United States that managed to continue doing some basic research um, through the dark decades. Um, I couldn't do any of that with NIMH support because NIMH dismissed the idea that we could learn anything about uh, psychiatric disorders from understanding how um, these compounds work. Um, I, in part because the, the onus was put upon the preclinical side to um, model DSM syndromes rather than what we now find more practical, which is studying dimensions of behavior that may not be limited to any one particular diagnostic category. Um, had we come to that earlier, perhaps psychedelics would have been able to um, be studied more effectively earlier on. And I think we would have come to atypical antipsychotics about 20 years earlier than we did because of what makes them atypical is usually antagonist actions at the serotonin 2a receptor yeah. which is yeah. where most of the psychedelic compounds have their primary action but we're in a very complex situation now um and 
I don't know how it's going to go. I, you know, I witnessed the demise of um, psychedelic research when Tim Leary made it became in Nixon's eyes the most dangerous man in the country and precipitated the war on drugs. Uh, right now, we have an acceptance of the idea that there may be potential therapeutic value by virtue of some of these recent studies. The effect sizes, in some cases, are surprisingly large. Um, a good example is smoking cessation where the 12 month uh, abstinence rate is uh, above 50% after um, one or two experiences with psilocybin. Um, nicotine addiction is not an easy thing to treat. Um, and it's a very objective measure with a very um, clear outcome assessment tool that you know, one can measure cotinine levels and know that whether or not a person is abstinent. So it's it's a really striking example of uh, the potential power of singular experiences with a robust dose of a psychedelic, uh, one or two experiences. And of course, nobody's quite clear on what form of plasticity um, is being engendered by these experiences. And people are incredulous at the duration of these um, effects, whether it's on depression or something like uh, substance use disorders. But perhaps that's not so, we shouldn't be so surprised at that. We know that uh, there's a tremendous reorganization of the brain and behavior and uh, life from a singular um, traumatic event like a car accident or a, a bomb going off or other um, trauma. So the events of a singular day can ha have a, a profound lasting effects. Um, so the, I, the, our amazement that the psilocybin effects are lasting so long maybe shouldn't be so surprising because they're profound experiences. Yeah. But no, what's going to happen sociopolitically right now, there, I think there are 96 uh, companies in North America on the stock exchange invested in psychedelic pharmacotherapies. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's not going to last. Um, not at all clear what the um, profit margin is ever going to be for pharma to make any money with these compounds when you, you only take them once or twice. Maybe you need booster doses every year or something. I don't know. We don't have any idea yet. Yeah. It's one of the surprising elements, you think, the fact that across the different models, different symptoms, different diseases, that it can be effective. That's, of course, surprising, but, uh, you know, traumatic injury leading to PTSD it also has uh, cuts across a lot of dimensions of, of behavior. Um, so we have a whole lot, a lot to learn. I'm gratified to think that we're now able to ask these questions. I'm very concerned that uh, it may go off the rails as it did in the in the 60s and 70s and people may be careless in the application of these powerful tools um i'm very concerned that we see more of what we've seen with ketamine which the ketamine is basically being used a lot off label and fda didn't have the opportunity to prescribe uh, the setting and the, the training required to administer ketamine. So there are all these pop-up clinics going around um, making making money, but we don't know how much good versus harm they're they're doing. Um, with with the psychedelics, FDA will have the opportunity to dictate how the therapies, you know, whether they're monitors, whether whether what the training required for the people administering the compounds to patients, but decriminalization 
which we're seeing in several states already, will work against that. And these are things that I don't think people should be trying at home without appropriate preparation and knowledge. And the so traps are very difficult, experience. aren't they, to design, Mark, wouldn't you say? I'm the sorry? Clinical, the clinical trials are going to be difficult to design because you've got this element of the clinical psychologist or therapist as well, and you've got a placebo to worry about. Um, what do you give us a placebo for a drug which produces this type of effect? Yeah, you know, there, we know the mechanism until we know the mechanism. Well, yeah, so no, far all the data yeah. suggests that the 2A receptor is the, yeah. the key. But, but also the psychological mechanism. You know, for example, is it necessary to have the, I don't know this, but you, you may know it, is it necessary to have a hallucinatory experience? Well, that's, of course, being debated. Um, pharma would very much like to have the answer be no. Because if the answer is no, they can sell pills without having to engage a psychiatrist, basically. Yeah. Uh, without, um, my belief is, based on the evidence that we have so far, that the answer is going to be yes, that you need the profound experience in order to have these en enduring effects. But that needs to be assessed. The two experiments that people are talking about doing, and one is to block the serotonin 2a receptor um and yeah. thereby blocking the experience but still having but you know that's a tautology you know <laughs> problem and the other experiment would be to to administer the compound uh under anesthesia but that's problematic because the brain is not inactive during anesthesia um we don't you know they may not be able to report faithfully what has what their experience was if they were to give, be given psilocybin under anesthesia but we can't be confident that there's not a lot going on um but it yeah that's certainly um, i mean there's a whole lot to learn i mean the choice of psilocybin was uh, for these experimentations these studies was quite pragmatic there's no reason to think it's the best drug there's no reason to think it's the best duration. Um, we have little information about dose. It, we're at the in, infancy of our study of the therapeutic effects of these compounds. And there's so many questions, but people running them up, I mean, the number of companies that are investing in it and starting up is just astounding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. This dialogue is great. I think it's exactly what we had hoped for for this panel. And then um, <laughs> we have Catherine here. She's thank you for your patience, Catherine. I know you had your hand raised for a little while. <laughs> Would you like to ask the panel a question or contribute to the conversation? Yeah, thanks, um, Fiona, for bringing me in and to you all for, for being here to provide your um, expertise. I guess, you know, listening to you talking um, and being aware of the sort of regulatory landscape in which we're trying to work, I think there's a really valid concern that people's experiences in real life are going to advance and outpace any progress we make in science. And we see this with the cannabinoids and we're seeing this with psilocybin, that it's easier to get it basically on the street through contacts, through friends, than it is to get it for scientific research purposes. And this really worries me as we try and you know, engage meaningfully in, in sort of clinical neuropsychopharmacological research. And I'm wondering if there's something that we need to just, you know, brainstorm or figure out, like, how can we change the conversation around that? I mean, Tony and Mark and Trevor, you've all sort of alluded to it, that the bureaucracy is what is really standing in the way of scientific progress. Like if, you know, as sort of like almost like a community neuroscientist, I get asked by my friends all the time, you know, oh, can I take this? Can I take that if I'm taking this drug and that drug? And I'm like, well, I'm not an MD, but you know, this is like the mechanism of action. And they're gonna go ahead and do that experiment like that evening. Um, and then, you know, I'm supposed to be like the expert on this stuff. And it's like, well, it's gonna take me 18 months to maybe give that to a rat. 
<laughs> and you know, how can we as scientists have any sort of credibility when we come to like talking to the public about these drugs when their experiences are gonna, you know, their knowledge is gonna outpace our own if we can't change the way in which, you know, drug trials are done, never mind in clinical populations, just in healthy volunteers. We don't even have yeah. that set up. Yeah. Yeah. So how do we how do we get to do that? Can we brainstorm that? Like, do we need to be talking about politicians? I mean, in yeah, BC yeah. in particular, we've yeah. never had so much buy in right from the public about, you know, the importance of mental health going, you know, we've just come off the COVID pandemic. It's on the morning radio shows all the time concerns about the opiate crisis. Can we not leverage that into actually getting a sit down meeting with policymakers? And is Matrix and perhaps our best shot at doing this before we lose this moment? Well, I wish you well doing that in Canada. We, we have had a shot at this in the UK <clears throat> with the Academy of Medical Sciences, who were quite responsive. Um, but unfortunately, working within government constraint, government have decided, you know, this will be the position. And so, Academy of Medical Sciences have been trying to mitigate that, if you see what I mean. You know, so it's it's always defensive, trying to just get back some of the um, possibilities we had before, rather than changing the whole landscape. It's very very difficult. You need to have the right political administration in place. And the other big problem, doing human volunteer studies. I mean, we've given up now in, in uh, Cambridge, certainly doing major human volunteer studies um, with drugs that are safe because they're considered as clinical trials. And so, <laughs> because they're not really clinical trials at all, but they're considered as clinical trials, which means you have to get enormous amounts of insurance and goes on and on and on. And it, so for a PhD student, they might take the first two years of their study trying to get ethics and approval to run the study. <laughs> and then by the yeah. time they've got that, they, they don't have time to actually complete it. So it's not they're not PhD projects and they're not three year projects anymore, actually. Project grant projects, they're program grant projects, <laughs> five years worth, and they're very expensive and, you know, uh, MRC and Wellcome Trust generally uh, don't fund this kind of stuff, actually. What MRC will do is they'll say, well, you know, you should apply to our clinical trials sector, and they will fund a very small number of real clinical trials on clinical populations, but they're not interested in normal human volunteer studies, I'm afraid. So in terms of what uh, Matrix M might do, Again, it goes back to the earlier discussion about the use of primates in this kind of research. Maybe again, th this is an example of where you need a center of excellence created. And there are many candidates. I mean, McGill would be another one in Canada and, and CAMH, yeah. and I think ourselves and yeah. maybe in collaboration with other colleagues in Western Canada. But maybe what we should be doing is putting forward, Catherine, uh, a compelling argument for why we need to get ahead of this curve. You know, as you say, uh, you know, uh, sociologically, we're already uh, on, on the spot. On the, we're on the spot, aren't we? <laughs> yes, indeed. But this is the sort of thing that you know. We what do we do? Just throw up our arms, or do we actually s yeah. sit down now on a at a point of crisis and opportunity, and try to figure out a strategy that may that may work? And I I would advocate for the center of excellence approach. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our dean, I know, is very concerned, as Mark was saying, about, you know, the uncontrolled use of the pop-up clinic approach to the use of ketamine and psychedelics. And I think it's very appropriate that he, that he expressed this concern. And so what I mentioned through our department head, Lashmi Atham, is that the Matrix N initiative uh, does not want to um, abandon support for this kind of research, but it wants to emphasize the need uh, for less bureaucracy, but more um, responsibility on the part of the research community. So we take charge of it. We don't, as Mark is saying too, his concerns are that this is going, the, the misuse of some bad episode here could ruin the whole opportunity again and set us back to 1970 again. Mm, um, right. So we have to really 
take charge. And so the, one of the purposes of this matrix initiative is to, we've got over 70 people now affiliated with, with uh, this initiative from all departments and, and many different faculties. Um, and so we may be in a unique position. We're, we're preparing a renewal. So maybe one of the things that we might want to emphasize there is the creation of a center of excellence uh, so that colleagues like Catherine and, and most especially the new colleague, the, the PhD students who would love to be working in this area uh, and the postdocs and all of the new colleagues that are coming into, into neuropsychiatry. You know, if we can create the, the, the proper atmosphere uh, with the appropriate support, both you know, to lessen bureaucracy and then also to enhance the financial support necessary because it's completely lacking right now. You know, we don't, we aspire to all of these things, but there's absolutely no, no money behind it. You, you, at least in Europe, you know, had a golden era there for about a decade and that's dried up, unfortunately. Uh, so there's a complete lack of commitment to long-term uh, support for, it's almost, you know, this was used in brain research, a moonshot. I mean, this really is, it's, it's a mind shot. It's okay. a mind shot. We, That's really, a great idea, yeah. we really may be in a position to, to have yeah. a huge impact. And, and then if we had a center of excellence here, we'd reach out to people like Mark and the center of excellence is being created at UCSD. We'd reach out to comparable group, David Nutt and whomever, you know, yeah. in the UK and, and others. And yeah. we could get on top of this really quickly. Um, if, and I think we might sure. do that. Yeah, I'm sure David Nutt would be a very good person to consult with. Yes, yeah, definitely. Um, but, but I'm turning the mic back to our chair. <laughs> How are we doing here, Fiona? We're at 10.20, I see. And, uh... Yes. <laughs> well, this is an excellent way to, to wrap up this session too, Tony, is, is just talking about the, the meaningful endeavors of Matrix N and the possibilities there. And still a lot of work, like an uphill battle to really reach some of the the effects and the implications. And then I also want to bring like the patient voice too in, in all of this and how to really mm -hmm. engage clinicians. It's another, you know, real task there, Clini like clinician researchers who really want to be on board and work together. So um, it's exciting that there's this momentum and I, I'm hoping this conference will, will drive this forward and build a lot of partnerships and maybe also you know, justify having this institute being set up or, the, or research excellence center. But one thing we oh, found with the BCNI okay. is training PhD students in behavioral and cognitive neuroscience who then became psychiatrists or neurologists. That's yeah. a really useful thing to do. Well, that's a good note to... That's to absolutely end. what you should... You can also well do in, at UBC, obviously. Yeah. I was thinking, oh. Trevor, sorry, I'm going beyond the deadline, but I'm thinking back to your slide where you were you had the acknowledgement of all of the fabulous work that was done in Sweden in the late 60s, which actually laid the network maps for the monoamine systems. Yeah. Uh, every one of those people was, sorry, my phone's going up. Every one of those people was trained as an MD first. Okay? <laughs> and then they learned their pharmacology, their histology, everything else. It was all informed by clinical yeah, questions. And this is a model, you know, for how should we be training our specialist MDs? You know, maybe they should have a degree in neuroscience before they go in and become psychiatrists. At least they let, then at least know what the brain's doing. That's our preferred route because well, I think what we found in the UK is if they get their clinical qualification first, they end up doing epidemiology or neuroimaging, which are very good things to do. But not so molecular and neuroscience based, if you see what I mean. And you think in our field of something like Saul Snyder, you know, a fantastic clinician, yeah. uh, an inspired scientist. Uh, I think a lot of the this final note about reverse translation, it's these sorts of unique individuals that have contributed disproportionately to the few successes that we've enjoyed. And we want to, we should be keeping that model in mind as we as we train the next generation. Absolutely. To carry on in this area. Yeah. Well, when it, when it comes to psychedelics, I think we can see that the train has already left the tracks. <laughs> if we can help keep the train on the tracks, I'd yes. be 
Yeah. Great. Well, good luck. We'll, as in many things, we'll be following in your footsteps or your train tracks, one or the other. <laughs> we'll be following Thanks. what you, you get up to. I'm sure we, we wish you all the best in this great endeavor. Thank you. Fiona, yeah. if I may just thank my colleagues, uh, I invited Trevor and Mark to join us in this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been fantastic. I just want to personally thank you both for an invaluable contribution. Uh, Mark, we obviously have renewed interest in shared scientific uh, questions. And so look forward to seeing you in person soon. Thanks, Fiona, Great. for being an excellent chair. Great. Okay, Great. thank you, you all. I'm calling you for another session, Tony. Okay, <laughs> okay. see you later. Bye. Thanks for your time.